This is chapter two of the course entitled Water Solubility of Organic Molecules. Now the topic of water solubility may seem a bit out of place for this course, but it actually provides a good transition from our discussion of molecular interactions into more traditional surface and colloid topics such as sorption, surface tension, and emulsion stability. It is also true that the solubilities of chemicals and polymers influence how they are handled and introduced to industrial systems, as well as their transport in various industrial operations and ultimate fate in the surrounding environment. Thus, the topic of water solubility is of great interest to those working with practical colloidal systems. This is the first of two lectures for the chapter. Here, we introduce the basic thermodynamic framework describing the dissolution of neutral organic chemicals into water, describe how solubility changes with the initial state of a chemical species, and provide a review of the various molecular interactions and energy changes involved in aqueous dissolution. The topics covered should provide students with the ability to assess and explain the relative water solubilities of simple organic compounds. The stability of an organic chemical when it is surrounded by water is a key factor in determining its behavior in industrial processes and in the environment. The less stable the molecule is, the greater its tendency to leave or flee, for example by moving into an adjacent phase, onto a surface, or into the vapor phase. We often use the water solubility of a molecule to gauge the stability. This is somewhat tenuous when dealing with solids and gases as we will discuss, but still approximately correct. As we will see, there are a number of measures such as the activity coefficient or excess free energy that provides a more direct gauge of a molecule's comfort level in the aqueous phase. But solubility is an important quantity for a number of reasons. For example, it helps determine how a chemical will be handled and introduced for industrial processes, also for medical applications. Water solubility can be defined as the maximum amount mass or moles of a compound I which can dissolve in a given volume of water. Throughout this course, water solubility will be designated using CIW with the superscript SAT indicating the water is saturated with the ith component. We will restrict our discussion to neutral organic compounds that are sparingly to moderately soluble. Specifically, those organic compounds with solubility is well below one mole per liter or one molar. This likely covers a majority of neutral organic species. Our focus this chapter is the dissolution of organic chemicals into water to form aqueous solutions. We will take a thermodynamic approach, so our interest is on the amount of organic solute dissolved in the water at equilibrium. Such a thermodynamic analysis provides no information on the rate at which dissolution occurs. But what it does provide is the saturation concentration of a solute, that is, its solubility, and how this changes with solution conditions. The rate of dissolution for organic chemicals is typically rapid, especially when compared to that of polymeric species. And for all practical purposes, we can assume that equilibrium is achieved instantaneously. A good place to start this discussion on dissolution thermodynamics is with a review of how Gibbs free energy changes for processes occurring in a closed system. The Gibbs free energy is usually denoted with G. As you know from your course on thermodynamics, G is defined as the enthalpy of the system, usually denoted with H, minus absolute temperature T multiplied by the entropy, denoted with S. If we differentiate this equation and consider small changes at constant temperature and pressure, a positive change in the free energy indicates that the system is moving away from equilibrium. A process moving in such a direction requires the input of work. If the free energy decreases with such a change, the system is moving towards an equilibrium state, a process that will occur spontaneously. And if the change is zero, the system has minimized its free energy and is at equilibrium. The same analysis can be used to assess phase transformations using the integrated form of the equation. Let's consider the phase transitions experienced by a molecular substance as it is heated from a solid to a gas at a constant pressure of one atmosphere. As the solid is heated, it takes in sensible heat and its temperature increases until the melting point is reached. At the melting point, denoted here Tm, the solid exists in equilibrium with the liquid. Adding heat to the system does not increase temperature, rather it results in the conversion of more mass into its liquid form. The free energy change associated with the melting of a solid at its melting temperature is zero. This is a reversible process occurring under equilibrium conditions. However, 
If the solid were placed in an oven above its melting point, it would spontaneously convert to the liquid state, and the free energy change would be negative. If a process were devised by which the solid could be converted from a solid to a liquid at temperatures below its melting point to form a supercooled liquid, the change in free energy associated with the melting process would be positive. That is, it would require work. Once melted, heating again provides sensible heat and an increase in temperature as the liquid moves towards another phase change to a vapor at its boiling temperature, denoted Tb. At the transition temperatures, phase transitions are reversible and occur with no change in the Gibbs free energy. However, if we calculate the change of free energy associated with this process carried out above or below the transition temperatures, we would find negative and positive free energy changes respectively, corresponding to spontaneous and non-spontaneous processes. As we will see, non-spontaneous processes play a role in determining the water solubility of organic chemicals. It is important to point out that we could have carried out the same discussion starting out in the vapor phase and cooling the substance all the way down to a solid. You should be familiar with the sign on the free energy changes associated with the non-spontaneous phase transitions. If we're going to discuss phase distributions, we have to introduce the chemical potential. In words, the chemical potential, which is indicated here, mu i, is the amount of free energy component i introduces to the system from its own potential energy and the new interactions it brings to the system. For an open system, one which can gain and lose chemical species, the Gibbs free energy can be written as a function of temperature, pressure, and the different chemical components indicated by ni. From this relationship, the chemical potential can be identified as the free energy change of a system per mole of added component I, with temperature, pressure, and all other mole quantities being held constant. For a closed system at constant temperature and pressure, there is no exchange of mass, and the terms containing the chemical potentials are zero. Thus, the free energy expression reduces to a form we reviewed earlier. However, if we consider two phases, alpha and beta, which are in contact and only open to each other. We have two open systems for which the terms of the chemical potential survive while the overall system is closed. At a constant temperature and pressure, the criteria for equilibrium can be applied to the combined systems. This tells us that an equilibrium distribution of component I between two phases alpha and beta exists only if the chemical potentials for I in the two phases are equal. This same argument can be extended to additional phases with the requirement for equilibrium being that the chemical potential for a component must be the same in all the phases. This approach is useful because it allows for the free energy of each solute to be developed individually. Thus, we could consider the free energy of dissolution of a solute independent of other solutes and the solvent. Clearly, chemical potential values are useful for determining the equilibrium distribution between phases, but it also provides information on the direction of net flow of chemical species. Chemicals move from higher potential to lower potential. Thus, if the chemical potential for component I is higher in the alpha phase, there will be a net movement of component I into the beta phase. If the potential is higher in the beta phase, the net movement of component I will be into the alpha phase. In general, if the chemical potential for component I is not equal in all phases composing a system, there will be a net movement of that component until values in all phases are the same. Of course, the only way the chemical potential is useful is if it can be tied to properties in the composition of organic solutes in a mixture. In other words, if it can be estimated. The derivation for the expression for the chemical potential of an organic solute in its liquid form is provided on the course site. All of the variables have been defined and for the most part are easy to understand. The only variable that may be new to you is the activity coefficient for component I indicated with gamma I. The activity coefficient can be thought of as a correction factor which accounts for non-ideal behavior. Now the definition of non-ideal behavior depends on how you define ideal behavior and there are a variety of ways that this can be done. Here, we adopt the definition of an ideal solution as one that obeys Rayot's law. According to Rayot's law, a solute's partial pressure above a solution is equal to its mole fraction in the solution multiplied by the vapor pressure for the pure liquid under the same conditions. In other words, 
An ideal solution is one in which the interactions between the solute and the surrounding solvent are the same as those that exist in the pure state. The activity coefficient gauges how far a real solution veers from ideal. The vapor pressure of a pure organic liquid is a good indication of the strength of the intermolecular forces that exist between the molecules. A high vapor pressure indicates weak interactions, while a low vapor pressure indicates strong physical bonding. The same is true for the partial pressure of solutes in solution. The higher the partial pressure for a solute, the less stable or comfortable it is. The activity coefficient in a solution is the ratio of a solute's actual partial pressure above the solution to that predicted by Rayout's law, assuming ideal solution behavior. In other words, the activity coefficient is a relative measure of the solute's instability in solution, which is a function of temperature, pressure, concentration, and the concentration of co-solutes. For an ideal mixture or solution, the activity coefficient is equal to 1. When the interactions are less stabilizing in the ideal solution than in the real solution, the solute's partial pressure is less than that predicted by Rayold's law, and the activity coefficient is less than 1. More typical, especially when dealing with organic solutes dissolving in water, is that a solute is less stable in solution than in the ideal solution, and the partial pressure is greater than that predicted by Rayold's law, because the solute has a greater tendency to escape. In this case, the activity coefficient is greater than one. An important parameter, especially for understanding the behavior of organic species in water, is the infinite dilution activity coefficient, distinguished with the symbol for infinity as a superscript. Infinite dilution conditions exist when a solute is present at such low concentrations, this is usually less than about 0.1 volume percent, that each solute is surrounded by a solvation shell, and these shells do not interact with those of other solutes. In other words, where the solutes are isolated and only interact with the solvent. While solute activity coefficients are dependent on solution conditions as well as solute concentrations, the infinite dilution activity coefficient is a property of the solution dependent on pairwise interactions between the solute and solvent molecules. For organic compounds in water that are sparingly to moderately soluble, saturation will occur within or near the infinite dilution region. Thus, it is often assumed that the activity coefficient at saturation is approximately equal to the infinite dilution aqueous activity coefficient. This is useful because there exists a variety of techniques for estimating this quantity. The table lists infinite dilution activity coefficients for the liquids shown in the first row, including n-hexane, benzene, diethyl ether, and ethanol. These solutes are dissolved in the liquids listed in the first column to form solutions. The solvents listed include n-hexadecane, trichloromethane, ethanol, and water. Understanding the table shown here requires that we draw on our understanding of molecular interactions from our first chapter. It may be beneficial to review the structures of the chemicals involved. Rather than reviewing the entire table, let's look at a few key examples. For ethanol and N-hexadecane at infinite dilution, the activity coefficient is 35. Remember that the activity coefficient is a measure of the solute's tendency to flee a solution relative to that in an ideal solution. In this case, we expect that ethanol is less stable in the solution at infinite dilution. It has lost the ability to participate in hydrogen bonding available in the ideal solution. In hexadecane, hydrogen bonding is replaced by much weaker van der Waals interactions. For diethyl ether and trichloral methane at infinite dilution, the activity coefficient is 0.3, indicating that the ether has a lower instability in the solution than in the ideal solution. This result is relatively rare but easy to explain using what we learned from our previous discussion on pairwise interactions. Diethyl ether is a proton acceptor, but not a proton donator. Trichloromethane is a proton donator, but not a proton acceptor. So in the solution, diethyl ether participates in strong hydrogen bonding with the surrounding trichloromethane solvent molecules. Such interactions are absent from the pure diethyl ether and trichloromethane phases. For all of the organic solutes in water at infinite dilution, the activity coefficient is greater than 1. And in the case of hexane, the value is quite large. But the interesting example in this row is the ethanol. Ethanol can form hydrogen bonds, but it appears to be less stable in water than it is in the ideal solution. 
The result demonstrates that solute stability depends not only on the interactions it forms with the surrounding molecules, but also those inhibited by its presence. Here, the ethanol in water interrupts more hydrogen bonds than it forms with water molecules, increasing its instability. Returning now to the dissolution process, we need to treat the dissolving organic solids and gases different from organic liquids. The reason is that when a solute dissolves into water, it becomes part of a liquid mixture. Thus, if we are saturating a solution with an organic solid, the process must take into account the melting of the solid. Likewise, when a gas is used to saturate a solvent, the thermodynamic description should account for its condensation to a liquid. As discussed, the melting below the melting point and the condensation above the boiling point are both non-spontaneous processes that would increase the free energy requirements to form a saturated solution and thus limit solubility. In the case of the solid, the positive free energy change is accompanied by a positive enthalpy change, while for the gas, the enthalpy change is negative. For determining the solubility at a fixed temperature, it is the positive free energy change that is important. But later, it will be shown that the differences in enthalpy play a significant role in determining the temperature dependency of water solubility for organic molecules. At this point, we have the background we need to examine the thermodynamics for the saturation of water with a sparingly soluble organic compound. We begin with the less complex case of organic liquids. For this, let's consider two pure phases, the organic molecule I in a pure liquid form and pure liquid water. These phases are brought together and allowed to equilibrate. Our interest is in the movement of the molecules from the organic phase into water. But as this is occurring, water molecules are also moving into the organic liquid. Thus, the organic phase is not pure, and we will have a chemical potential for I in the water-saturated organic phase, indicated by mu I O, and a chemical potential for I in the organic-saturated water phase, indicated by mu I W. At equilibrium, the chemical potentials for I in both phases are equal. These are given from the expressions described above. The superscripts SAT indicate that the concentrations in both the organic and water phases are at their saturation levels. Because we have restricted our discussion to species that are sparingly to moderately soluble in water, it is reasonable to assume that little water will enter the organic liquid. That is, the product of the mole fraction and activity coefficient of I in the organic phase is approximately equal to 1. This reduces the expression, resulting in a relationship between the mole fraction of the organic solute I in the aqueous solution and its activity coefficient at the saturation point. Given the low solubility of the organic species being considered, true approximations are possible. First, as discussed previously, we can use the infinite dilution aqueous activity coefficient for the activity coefficient at saturation. Second, the molar volume of the aqueous solution can be approximated with the molar volume of pure water. With these, we have an expression for predicting the water solubility of an organic liquid. The free energy change for the dissolving of an organic chemical into an aqueous solution is given by the difference in its chemical potential for the two contacting phases. The free energy of dissolution can be thought of as being composed of two contributions, both an ideal and a non-ideal free energy. The ideal portion is the ideal entropy of mixing, which assumes that solute and solvent molecules are identical yet distinguishable, which is the essence of what we have defined as an ideal solution. This free energy contribution is always present when forming a solution, promoting mixing and greater molecular freedom. It can be seen that this value is related to the natural log of the solute mole fraction. Thus, for solutes of low to moderate solubilities, the ideal entropy of mixing strongly promotes solution formation. The non-ideal contribution to the free energy of dissolution accounts for those interactions that cause the solution to deviate from an ideal solution. This value can be negative, promoting the dissolution process, but for solutes of interest here, it will be positive and inhibit the process, oftentimes greatly. This non-ideal free energy contribution is more commonly known as the excess free energy, denoted here with GIW with the superscript capital E. 
It can be broken down further into excess enthalpy and excess entropy contributions, which will be discussed shortly. At equilibrium, the ideal free energy is balanced by the excess free energy. Given that the excess free energy is related to the natural log of the aqueous activity coefficient of a solute, the higher its aqueous activity coefficient, the more its dissolution is inhibited. The example asks us to use the infinite dilution aqueous activity coefficient calculated for diethyl ether using Unifact at 25 degrees Celsius to both estimate its water solubility and calculate the ideal and non-ideal or excess free energy associated with the dissolution process. Diethyl ether has a melting point of negative 116 degrees C and a boiling point of 34.6 degrees C. Thus it is a liquid at the temperature of interest. For part A, we invert the Unifact infinite dilution value and divide by the molar volume for water. This results in a water solubility estimate of 0.343 moles per liter. Reported experimental values are about 0.8 molar. The air is a little bit high, but not too bad for such estimates. An issue here is that the water solubility of diethyl ether is at the high end of what would be considered moderately soluble. For part B, to calculate the ideal energy contribution of dissolution, we use RT natural log of the mole fraction at saturation. This provides a value of negative 12.6 kilojoules per mole. Thus, the ideal free energy contribution is promoting dissolution. The non-ideal free energy of dissolution in water, or the excess free energy, is calculated using RT natural log of the activity coefficient. This produces a value of 12.6 kilojoules per mole, which limits dissolution. The overall free energy of dissolution is equal to the sum of the ideal and non-ideal values which equals zero at equilibrium as expected. When describing the solubilities of organic compounds that are either solids or gases at the temperature of interest, the free energy associated with their non-spontaneous conversion to a liquid must be taken into account. This makes a positive contribution to the free energy, which inhibits dissolution. These contributions are obtained from the differences in chemical potentials for non-spontaneous phase changes, which are added to our previous free energy expression for the organic liquid. By rearranging the resulting equations for solids and gases, the expression for their solubilities are obtained, where P0S and P0L are the vapor pressures for the pure, solid, and supercooled liquid, respectively, and P0G is the vapor pressure for the gas phase, usually arbitrarily assigned a value of one atmosphere, and P0L is a vapor pressure for the pure, superheated liquid. Values for these are required at the temperature of interest. It can be seen that the free energy associated with the non-spontaneous conversion to a liquid leads to a more complex expression for estimating water solubilities for organic compounds. Also note that infinite dilution aqueous activity coefficients are often extracted from water solubility values. Clearly, care must be taken when such values are estimated. The example asks us to estimate the free energy associated with the conversion of phenol from a solid to supercooled liquid at 25 degrees C. Phenol is a solid at 25 C, so this is a non-spontaneous process. Its solubility and activity coefficient at saturation are provided at this temperature. From the equation for the water solubility of a solid organic, we can determine the ratio of the vapor pressures for the pure solid and supercooled liquid and negative RT natural log of this provides an estimate of the free energy associated with the melting of phenol below its melting point. As we expected, this value is greater than zero. Next, let's discuss the molecular origins of solubility limits on organic chemicals. We will do this by connecting structural characteristics of organic solutes to excess enthalpy and entropy values which compose the excess free energy. We begin by examining the excess enthalpy contribution involved in a process that moves a single organic molecule from the organic liquid phase into the aqueous solution. However, we will take a roundabout path, a path that allows us to see the various contributions to the overall excess enthalpy term. This starts with the isolation of a single molecule, which requires the breaking of bonds with adjacent molecules in the organic phase. The first step requires energy, that is delta H1 is greater than zero, where the subscript indicates the step. This value can be estimated from the heat of vaporization for the organic compound. As discussed previously, more polar compounds have higher heat of vaporization values. This is especially true if hydrogen bonding is present. 
The second step involves building a cavity in the water phase large enough for the isolated organic solute to be held. This also requires energy, that is delta H2 is greater than zero. And in the case of water, it's likely that this value is significant because a number of hydrogen bonds must be broken. In step three, the solute molecule is transferred into the cavity, allowing the water to interact with the organic solute. This allows the solute and surrounding water molecules to at least partially recover lost physical interactions, which are stabilizing, that is delta H3 is less than zero. The net excess enthalpy change resulting from the breaking and forming of intermolecular bonds required for introducing the organic solute into the aqueous solution cavity has been denoted delta H cap. For an ideal solution for which the recovered interactions are identical to those lost by the solute in being removed from the organic liquid, delta H cav is equal to zero. However, for the transfer of organic compounds with limited water solubility, it is expected that delta H cav is greater than zero. For nearly any other solvent besides water, our discussion of enthalpy would end here. But in the case of water, one more term must be considered. Earlier in the course, we discussed the unique structure of water. This provides for a fourth step in which water optimizes hydrogen bonding around the non-participating, non-polar component of an organic solute, forming clathrate-like hydration shells. This reduces the enthalpy, that is, delta H4, designated oftentimes as delta H ice, is less than zero. It's important to emphasize that there is no ideal enthalpy of dissolution. The excess value is the enthalpy of dissolution. As you might expect, this value is dependent on the size of the organic compound, specifically the surface area of its nonpolar regions. The greater this surface area, the greater the disruption to the hydrogen bonding network in water. Within a chemical family, surface area correlates with molecular weight, but care must be taken when crossing between families. Structures that are more highly branched and or have a higher connectivity will have a lower surface area when compared with unbranched species of similar molecular weights. Thus, both size and structure matter in determining excess enthalpy and ultimately solubility. The polarity of a solute also plays a key role in determining the excess enthalpy. The more the solute can interact with water, the lower the excess enthalpy. The effect is large when hydrogen bonding is involved especially for solutes possessing hydroxyl or amino groups. For van der Waals interactions not involving hydrogen bonding, the effect tends to be small, oftentimes negligible. This is a figure from Schwarzenbach's book on environmental organic chemistry. The figure plots excess enthalpy measured at 25 degrees Celsius as a function of total surface area of organic solutes for two chemical families, aromatic hydrocarbons, shown on the left-hand side, and linear alcohols shown on the right. For the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that are solids at 25 degrees C, values are corrected for the heat of melting. Both plots cover a similar total surface area region and produce linear relationships with roughly similar slopes. However, for the alcohols, the intercept of the line is shifted significantly downward due to the presence of hydroxyl groups, which provides for hydrogen bonding with water. The entropy analysis is a bit more complicated. For organic species of limited water solubility, the process of isolating a molecule, building a cavity in the water, and introducing the solute likely results in diminished bonding and greater molecular freedom, increasing entropy. This is the delta S cav quantity. This is offset by the decrease in entropy, the delta S ice associated with the ordering of water molecules around non-polar components of solutes to optimize hydrogen bonding. In addition, the formed clathrate-like hydration shells tend to limit the molecular motion of these segments. For flexible structures, such as those possessing long, unbranched chains, the decrease in entropy can be significant. A final contribution that needs to be accounted for is the excess entropy of mixing. As discussed, the ideal entropy of mixing assumes identical molecular species that are distinguishable. The provided expression in molar volumes is the excess term which accounts for differences in the size between solutes and water. Given that organic solutes tend to be larger than water molecules, this term reduces entropy. The influence of the excess term increases with the volume of the solute, but in general, its overall contribution to the excess entropy tends to be quite modest. Thus, the structural characteristics that govern excess entropy are the volume of the solutes as well as their flexibility. 
The influence of the former is small, but the latter can be significant for species possessing long, flexible, nonpolar regions. The table lists structures, properties, and data measured at 25 degrees Celsius for three aromatic hydrocarbons containing an increasing number of rings and three linear alcohols of increasing chain lengths. Both sets roughly cover the same molecular weight range. Data are provided for the liquid or supercooled liquid forms of the solutes. This column lists excess entropies of dissolution. For the sets, the excess entropies are negative and decrease with increasing solute size. For the aromatic hydrocarbons, the change is quite small and likely attributable to the excess entropy of mixing term. For the linear alcohols, there is a much stronger dependency on the size of the solute. This is likely due primarily to the increasing inhibition of molecular motion of the unbranched alkyl chain, an effect that increases with chain length. The key points from the previous discussion have been shaped into a set of guidelines for assessing differences in the water solubilities between organic solutes. These are listed here pretty much in order of importance. They include hydrogen bonding capability. The most significant factor influencing water solubility is the presence of functional groups capable of forming hydrogen bonds, in particular those with the ability to both accept and donate protons. Flexibility. For similar size organic molecules, rigid species tend to be more water soluble than flexible ones. This is apparent when comparing the solubilities of linear species with same size cyclic or aromatic structures. Surface area. Solubility of organic molecules decrease with increasing surface area of nonpolar regions. For example, higher molecular weight homologs and analogs have lower water solubilities, while more highly branched species have higher water solubilities. Polarity and polarizability. For organic species of similar size and structure, those with greater dipole moments, permanent and or induced, tend to have greater water solubilities. And finally, phase behavior. For organic solids and gases, the non-spontaneous phase transition to a liquid decreases its water solubility relative to their supercooled or superheated liquid form, respectively. Let's apply these rules to compare the water solubilities for a variety of organic species at 25 degrees Celsius. The first comparison is N-hexane with N-heptane. Both species are liquids at 25 degrees C. These are homologs with the heptane possessing an additional methylene linkage. Based on the provided guidelines, we would predict that the hexane is more water soluble. For this next comparison, we add a hydroxyl group to N-hexane, which provides it with the ability to form hydrogen bonds. This should increase its water solubility. In fact, the increase is substantial. Next, we compare benzene with chloral benzene. Both of these compounds are liquids at 25 degrees Celsius. You might be surprised to find that benzene is actually more water-soluble. While the carbon-chlorine bond is polar, providing the chloral benzene with a permanent dipole moment, it provides for only weak van der Waals interactions, not hydrogen bonding. Furthermore, the chlorine atom is quite large. It appears that the polarity provided by the chlorine atom is not sufficient to offset its disruption to the bonding in water. Next, we compare benzene with aniline. Both compounds are liquids at 25 degrees C. It should be clear to you here that aniline is going to be the more soluble species due to the presence of a functional group that can form hydrogen bonds with water. The last comparison is interesting. It's between phenol and aniline. Aniline is a liquid at 25 degrees C, but phenol is a solid. Both compounds have similar molecular weights and structure in that both possess groups capable of accepting and donating protons. It turns out that phenol, in its supercooled liquid form, as well as its solid form, are slightly more water-soluble than liquid aniline. This can be explained from the greater polarity of the hydroxyl group. It seems that the free energy associated with the non-spontaneous phase transition is not enough to make solid phenol less soluble than liquid aniline. This completes Lecture 1 of Chapter 2.